Welcome to A Living History of Bronxville. I'm Marsha Lee, and today we have someone with us who lived in Bronxville for some years and now has moved to Washington, D.C., but he has a book, Ben Franklin, An American Life, that has been on the top of the bestseller list, and I thought it would be a lot of fun to interview him today. His name is Walter Isaacson. Thank hey, you for Marcia, joining it's us. Great to be with you. Fun. Welcome back. I know Thanks. you've just flown in from Washington. Yes, You're right. Um, well, you have had such an incredible career. You've been um, the former managing, you're the former managing editor of Time Magazine, mm -hmm. the former chairman. And, and we brought a whole lot of Time Magazine people out here to Bronxville. Right. Bill Payton and Nancy Gibbs and others. Uh, right, Nancy Gibbs, I see her yeah. frequently. Um, and uh, you were the former chairman and CEO of CNN. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've written quite a number of books. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Kissinger. Kissinger, yes. And the one we're going to talk about, Ben Franklin, An mm. American Life. And uh, you're now with the Aspen Institute. Right. So, um, let's, when we start this, we, we keep these tapes actually in the uh, history room. Mm. And so we usually start with just a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. I was born in New Orleans. Born in New Orleans. Uh, 1952. Right. And uh, my family still lives in New Orleans. They all went to Tulane. My grandparents went to Tulane. But I went north to college. I went to Harvard. Yeah. And then uh, won a road so I could go to Oxford. Studied there. But I loved New Orleans and worked on the times Picayune State's item, the newspaper there. Mm -hmm. Uh, worked a little bit on the Sunday Times of London, but eventually got recruited by Time Magazine after I was covering politics in New Orleans. Uh, one of the editors at Time had seen uh, my uh, City Hall column for uh, the Times Picayune State's item. Right. And so in 1978, I moved up uh, to Time Magazine and then moved to Washington for Time Magazine and then finally back up to New York for Time Magazine uh, when I became national editor, and that's when I moved to Bronxville. So it was just one, one thing <laughs> after the other. By the way, do you know Bob McDonald, who's from New Orleans, uh, no. who is uh, head of, well, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so then after, what was it like um, when you finally became managing editor of Time Magazine? I mean, was this... Well, it's fine. I mean, it's I, a, what does the managing yeah. editor do? It's a What's huge job. What's the editor job. of Time Magazine? And... You know, you have a group of a team you put together, one to edit the nation section, the world section, the business section, the arts, society, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. We had a great team. As I mentioned, Priscilla Payton, who lives in Bronxville, she became the national editor. And we, uh, we both love politics, so that was a lot of fun to do. And I love foreign policy and world affairs. So, uh, you know, what you do as the editor is pretty much uh, spend all your week worrying about what should be in the magazine and who should write it. And then you'll... Uh, the end of the week, editing what's going in the magazine. Yeah. So you have, you're <coughs> constantly facing all these deadlines and trying. Well, yeah, but it's over every it's week. And then you start I know, and then you know. start again. Yeah. And uh, selecting the yeah. uh, key article for the yeah. week and the key. Yeah. How, do you, how do you go about selecting the uh, cover? <coughs> well, cover you have a um, nice uh, oval table or long table at the conference room, and everybody makes their pitch that their stories or you know, their section stories should be on the cover. You try to do a mix. Mm -hmm. I mean, just this week, I know, let's talk about living history. I was just right. had lunch with the editor of Time, my successor. And during the lunch, it was said that Martha Stewart had been convicted on all counts. And right. so he asked me whether he should change covers or not. And he was doing another cover. And um, what was so we kicked answer? it around. Uh, I, I think we'll let uh, him make the you're, decision. You're going to keep us guessing. Okay, uh, we're gonna I'll look. let him make his decision, and uh, you'll see on Monday what he chose. What was your favorite? Yeah. What was your favorite? Coverage. My favorite uh, coverage, <coughs> leaving aside the major news we had to cover, which, mm -hmm. you know, elections and wars and that sort of thing, was the 100 Most Important People of the Century series oh, we did that culminated that with Albert Einstein being the person of the century. Because it was very much of a parlor game, but also intellectual, fun, mm -hmm. thoughtful. You got the best possible writers to write about people. And you got to think, what did this century mean? Well, freedom won, so yeah. that was an important part of the century. Science triumphed. Technology took us to new places. 
And so you got to do a lot of thinking as, and look ahead and look back and put everything in context. Yeah, incredible century. Yeah. Now you went on to CNN. That, right. shock, that surprised us all, Walter. Well, <laughs> it surprised me <laughs> too. I'm not sure I didn't like TV <laughs> that much. You didn't stay there too long, but why? <laughs> how could you be a, a, so committed to, to hard right. print and all of a sudden go to, to uh, television? Oh, I actually, since this is for a nice history vault, uh, we'll admit <laughs> that it was a mistake. I, Uh-oh, I you heard not, it here. Um, I'm not an expert in TV. I don't love TV the way some people do. I felt it was journalism that CNN needed an injection of good, straight, hard journalism. Uh, There were a lot of people at uh, Time Warner who were pushing me very strongly uh, to go to CNN, pushing my wife Kathy that I should accept it. Uh, I finally agreed to accept it, but when I got to CNN, there were certain things I felt I could do, move some of it up to New York, bring in some real talent, some real... uh, you know, professional journalists. Uh, but in the end, after a couple of years and my contract was running out, I knew that I wasn't going to spend the rest of my life in TV. I'd done what I needed to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, then you made a big switch to the Aspen Institute. Yeah, Tell you us know, about like Benjamin that. Benjamin Franklin, uh, halfway through his career in media and journalism, which is what he was doing. Right. Most people don't think of him. Yeah, but he was a printer, publisher, newspaper editor, right. columnist, you know, that sort of thing. He steps back to become a civic leader, uh, uh, engaged in the world of thought, the world of ideas, the world of politics. I'd been in journalism covering things from the sideline my entire life. I figured it was now time to get involved and to be engaged around the world in international activities, but also in Washington and, you know, with an an institute like the Aspen Institute that's educational. It's a think tank. It's educational in part of what it does. It has Uh seminars and discussions and uh, and it's a leadership institute for young people. We have uh, fellows around the world in different countries that do it. And thirdly, it's a think tank. It has a foreign policy think tank, a education, environment, 15 different programs of think tank. So it allowed me to get involved and try to figure out what I felt about the world of ideas rather than trying to remain neutral. I mean, journalists are never totally neutral, but you try to remain neutral and not have an opinion on things. Obviously, journalists sometimes have opinions, but you spend, I spent 20 years of my life trying not Not to. to have opinions. And I want to spend the next 20 years developing, you know, my thoughts thoughts and ideas. Now, compared to the Brookings Institute or something like that, I mean, is the Aspen Institute's mission really a lot different or is it fairly similar? Yeah, it's somewhat different. I work very closely with Brookings. One of my best friends, Shrub Talbot, runs Brookings. We're a half a block away from Brookings. Mm -hmm. Brookings has scholars that do hardcore writing and thinking. They're a pure think tank. They don't have any public programs, educational outreach programs. They don't have seminars that people can sign up for. If you want to sign up for an Aspen seminar, anybody can. Uh, lots of people from Bronxville have done so. Uh, Roger Mulvihill. So your, your mission is just broader. Yeah, our mission is much broader. Uh-huh. It's to be educational. It's to uh, bring people together for informed dialogue and discourse, as well as to have policy programs that do thinking. Yeah. Well, that's that's um, mm-hmm. quite a bigger mission than the Brookings Institute. Let's, let's get to this wonderful sure. book. I, I'm going to hold it up again. Yeah. Ben Franklin, An American Life. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but about 10, 12 years ago, you were kind enough to speak at my daughter's uh, senior um, scholarship uh, yeah. dinner. At, at actually, it was at the Field Club. Mm-hmm. And at that time, <laughs> this is a long time ago, you said you were working on a book about Ben Franklin. Right. Uh, the first well, American. it took me a long time to do it. You had it a day did. job. It did. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is a huge book. Yeah. Um, how did you ever fit this into your well, schedule? Well, you know, people ask, how do you find time to do something? And I ask, well, how do you find time to play golf or watch TV or go to a movie? If you love something, you find time to do it. I was passionate about this about book. Doing. It was my hobby. Uh, you know, I have many other hobbies, but I don't play golf. So people can spend hours playing mm-hmm. golf. I'd spend hours. I have hours. a feeling you got up in the wee hours of the morning. No, or you actually, the... I was a late night person. Late night. I, uh, I, my family go to bed. They're kind of early to bed types. Ben Franklin always said early to bed and early to right. Right, right. So I was never either one. And uh, so around 9 or 10, they'd be, you know, reading in bed, and I'd start work. And I'd try to work for two or three hours. And when I moved to Atlanta, I could do that as well. I'd start mm-hmm. around 9 or 10 at night and work till about 1 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I loved it so much, it was very you just, energizing. It wasn't. Well, your sources, I mean, this is what's incredible. 
how do you ever bring together so many different sources? Well, there's a, and, all I mean, of Franklin's writings have been brought together by Yale University. And the Packard Humanities Institute I didn't put know them that. all on They've a CD-ROM. So I had them all downloaded on my computer. I could search by Isn't word, by incredible? correspondent, whatever. Everything, 47 volumes of his papers, each about 1,000 pages mm -hmm. long. So it's 47,000 pages of his papers were all downloaded on my computer and at the Yale Library as well as uh, published so there was elsewhere. So it was easy to find his own writings. Mm -hmm. I had to travel around some to find stuff that people had written about him. Yeah. Well, you, you know, Harry Blackman has just made his uh, yeah. all, <laughs> and that's yeah. probably going to be um, uh, at, at Yale too. Um, well, let's talk about Ben Franklin. Why, why do you feel or do you feel he was the first American? I mean, what he makes him different? He was very middle class. He was a shopkeeper, and he was proud to be middle class. And he helped develop the virtues. He, he grew up in Boston, didn't he? Well, he, he ran away Boston. from Boston when he was seventeen. Goes yeah. to Philadelphia, a few coins in his pocket, opens a print shop in Philadelphia, and becomes what he calls a leather apron. We, the middling people, the shopkeepers, artisans, and tradesmen of Philadelphia. And it yeah. was his rallying cry that America was going to be based on middle class values. If you look at the other founders, they're up there in marble. St marble. They're on a pedestal. Right. And they're also part of an elite, whether it be Washington or Adams or Jefferson or Madison or Hamilton and stuff. Uh, Franklin's really the only pure self-made entrepreneur in mm. the bunch. And it's his type of America, his envisioning of a, an America that was based on Main Street, you know, populist, sort of that the mix common of conservatism man. Yeah. and liberalism that you find in the Main Street populist mm -hmm. common man businessman. That would be the backbone of America. Now, Philadelphia, um, you think it was the environment and the whole um, uh, area down there that allowed him to survive in that? Would he have been um, in Virginia like Jefferson and Washington were? Would he have been accepted? No, Philadelphia was very important to yeah. what he became because it was a mix of so many types of people. When he ran away from Puritan Boston, which was dominated by the John clergy, uh, but dominated by the Mather family yeah, right. and stuff, he went to a city, Philadelphia, which means brotherly love, as you know. And there were not only uh, Puritans there, there were Anglicans, there were Methodists, there were Jews, there were Moravians, and the there were, were Lutherans, there. Yeah. there were Quakers, uh, the Presbyterians from Scotland, uh, of Germany, a lot of influx of German immigrants. It was a melting pot of different cultures. And Franklin felt that the vitality of Philadelphia, and in his mind, the vitality of America, mm -hmm. would come from being a melting pot in which we were tolerant of different religions and different types of people. So During his lifetime in Philadelphia, he donated to the building fund of each and every church that was built in Philadelphia. And at one point, they were building a hall for itinerant preachers, and he wrote the fundraising document saying, even if the Muftai of Constantinople were to send somebody <laughs> to preach Mohammed to us, we ought to listen, an, and we ought to have a pulpit. So and he was freedom the largest, of religion. He yeah, was, let me finish, you know, he was the largest single contributor to the Mikva Israel Synagogue. Uh, and so he was somebody who believed very much in tolerating different mm -hmm. religions and different ethnicities. Yeah. Now, you were saying earlier that he would have, been a, he would have fit beautifully in Bronxville as a volunteer. Yeah. Um, let's go into that. I, I was incredulous at the number of, of uh, institutes and things he set up, uh, uh, such as the library system. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very involved in civic life, and Bronxville is a very neighborly civic place where yeah. people form associations. He loved forming associations. He built a library, the first lending li free lending library, a subscription lending library in, in the United States, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Not just in Philadelphia. Uh, he built a hospital based on a matching grant fundraisers where people would donate to match what the legislature did. He did a street sweeping corps. He did the first militia, a fire, volunteer fire department. So he loved forming these groups. Mm -hmm. and, and he set up the postal neighborly. system, yeah. the U.S. postal system, too. Mm -hmm. Incredible, just mm -hmm. incredible. But then he moved, um, he went back to, he went over to London. He went to London to try to stop the American Revolution, not very successfully. And yeah, this, I think, yeah. was interesting coming out. I mean, I always assumed he was on the, uh, you know, the... Uh, the rebels' side, the, yeah. uh, but he wasn't. At first, he was a loyalist trying to well, prevent. He was trying to hold together the empire. He believed yep. in empire. He believed uh, that the English empire should be filled with different coequal, you know, parts. Meaning America or the United States, Canada, it'd be a commonwealth like it became. But that yeah. America should be part of a commonwealth, not ruled from London. 
but all loyal to the empire. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to have a democracy over here that would be its own nation in a way, but still part of the British Empire. Uh, he was unable to do that. It's interesting, he brings his illegitimate son over to England with him, William. Right, yeah. And William becomes very aristocratic, high-born, um, royalist, but, but hanging around with the aristocracy. And Frank, Franklin's autobiography is partly a letter to his son saying, remember your humble roots. Remember that we're proud to be middle-class shopkeepers and we're not trying to be mm -hmm. aristocratic. And in the end of the book, you point out that, that Franklin, coming back from France at that time, met with his son, and they never had a rapprochement. They, they, no, they, they fall apart, uh, break apart at the Revolution, yeah. because um, Franklin finally, in 1775, casts his lot with the Patriots, the right. Rebels, and he wants his son, William, to join him, and William doesn't. And making it all the more poignant is William had his own illegitimate son named Temple. Right. There's a tug of war between these two between Benjamin Franklin and William Franklin for the loyalty of this beautiful grandkid of Benjamin Franklin's name, Temple Franklin, who eventually ends up on his on grandfather's side. side. But then he dies early, doesn't he? He dies no. rather, t I thought Temple died rather young. No. Mm -hmm. um, well, he lives in London. He, he uh, comes back to the United States just as the revolution is occurring. Did he play a really crucial role in the um, uh, Declaration of Independence and that whole meeting in I mean, what was his role there? Yeah, well, you know, he gets back to Philadelphia and they form a committee to write the Declaration. It's the last time Congress formed a good committee. It had <laughs> Adams and Jefferson and Franklin on Right. It. And uh, Jefferson writes the first draft, but Franklin's the editor. And he even takes that great, uh, I'll show it to you here, he takes the uh, first draft of Jefferson, and Jefferson has written, we hold these truths to be sacred. I don't uh -huh. know where the camera is, but right there. Uh, we, and you can see I put it in the book because this is in the Library of Congress, but you, you have to go to the basement to find it. We hold these truths to be sacred, and there's the printer's backslashes of Benjamin Franklin, and he writes self-evident on top. We hold these truths to be self-evident, and he wanted to make the point that our rights are dependent on the consent of the governed and on rationality and reason, not on the dictates or dogma of any religion. Of religion. So that's the reason he used yeah. it, self-evident, yeah. very important. So he was crucial in mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence. And then he goes to France in order to try to make that document right. a reality by getting France in on our side in the war. And then finally comes back after France helps us win the revolution and he helps negotiate the peace treaty with England, comes back just in time to be part of the Constitutional Convention. And, which and he's, he's got to be a long in years then. He's, he's 80 and he's twice as old as the average age of the other members there. And he's the one who sort of the sage. Yeah, He's and he wise. plays the role of the sage he there. He plays the person who helps compromise or bring people together, because they're tearing each other apart on the big state, little state issue and all that sort of thing. And Franklin's the one who says, um, compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. We all have to give up a little mm -hmm. if we're going to have a great document. And he brings it about. He's he brings it he's about successful. and he proposes the House Senate compromise. Would we have had um, the uh, Constitution yeah. without him? Yeah, probably. There's no one indispensable person. Even George Washington's not indispensable. Mm -hmm. But you would not, you would, the Constitutional Convention may have broken down in 1787 without Franklin. He's the one who ca kind of calmed everything down. Right. Eventually you would have had a new Constitution, but you would have probably had a lot more struggles before you got it. Got it. Pulled together. Well, Walter, we could go on yes, forever yeah. interviewing you. I, I could yeah. ask a gazillion questions, well, uh, but uh, I mean, I'll ask one last one. Yeah. Are you working on another book? I yeah, mean, I'm going to do a biography of Albert Einstein. Ah. I feel ah. that it's important for us to embrace science. You can't be a great citizen of the 21st century unless Without you have it. some appreciation for the magic and the methods of science. And too often, people like myself, perhaps people like yourself, are intimidated by science. And I, I want to say, look, Einstein can be your friend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this may have come out of your magazine, your, yeah. the uh, yeah, person of the century. century. I mean, yeah. Well, thank you very thank much you so for much. joining us, to, uh, and we'll look forward to the Albert Einstein you. book. Okay. And thank you very much for joining us. Good night. Great interview. Thank you.